sound checks okay? Good. It's good? Okay, good. Uh, yeah, my name is Joe Asamoah, and uh, some people call me Dr. Joe. And uh, I've been on Bigger Pockets, as Ross has said, a few times. And uh, I've been investing in the DC area for about uh, 35 years. So it's probably longer than most people here are born. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I've been through uh, four real estate cycles. Okay, and this probably going to the fifth one now. And so I have a pretty good idea how all this plays out. And, uh, and so what I'm going to share with you uh, are lessons learned, experience, what works, what doesn't work. And, uh, and what I'm going to talk about is what I do. Okay, what I do, do th today. Okay, I'm in the field, I'm buying stuff, and uh, I'm trying to encourage more people to do what I do. <clears throat> because it works. And it passed the test of time. Okay, fads come and go, but this works. And I'll explain to you why I feel that way. If you disagree with me, hey, just ask me some tough questions, and it's all good. Um, but I stand behind what I'm going to say, and I think as I go through it, you'll probably, hopefully, uh, understand where I'm coming from, and, uh, and so on. We good? Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about, um, you know, some of the strategies, um, you know, that really work in the test of time through uncertain times. We're kind of going through some uncertain times now. We don't know where the market's going. It could be going up, down, whatever. But what I do really doesn't matter. So that's what we're going to share, talk about today. So let me, hopefully this will work. There you go. Okay. A bit about me. Who am I? Uh, as you can see me, this is my younger self over there. Uh, <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, I, I, I was born in Ghana, and uh, we moved to England when I was five years old. And uh, I stayed in England until... Um, October the 17th, 1985, at 7.30 on TW8 Flight 732. And that is me at the airport, getting ready to come to America. <laughs> okay, that's, that's my younger self. And uh, on the, below is uh, one of my tenants, uh, one of my properties, and obviously I'm there, there. And so I came to the US, um, you know, um, and uh, I was working a regular job, no, no big deal. I was transferred my job from London to here. And uh, the, the, the strange thing happened was that um, I, I went back to England for a vacation after six weeks. And my, I came back, and my boss, who I was working for at that time, was fired. Okay, just like that. And uh, which was unbelievable, because that never happens in Europe. Uh, you got to give, like, you know, two years' notice. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so on. this guy was fired, okay, and, uh, which was shocking. And so what happened was that I connected with him several weeks later for a cup of coffee, and that conversation pretty much changed the whole trajectory of uh, my life in the U.S. <clears throat> Essentially what happened was that um, this guy says to me, hey, Joe, <clears throat> you know, hey, this happens. This is America. But whatever you do, make sure you have a plan B. Uh, my plan B, I have these rental properties. And this guy had like 10 houses. And, and to me, at that time, I just couldn't fathom how, how, how is it possible to, I mean, I, you can figure out maybe one house, maybe two, 10. It's like, who does that? <laughs> uh, he said, I'm okay. I have this rental income coming through. But whatever you do, make sure that, because this could happen to you, make sure you also have your plan B. Okay, so that was a conversation because until that time, I really didn't understand real estate. I didn't know anybody who had real estate. I was just like everybody here, just working, you know, and just go home, go to sleep, and go back to work again, and, uh, and so on. So anyway, we, we um, so essentially what happened was I, I uh, a few weeks later, I saw one of those infomercials, you know, those late night ones. Uh, you too can do this. All you got to do is buy my, give me your credit card and uh, all will be well. <laughs> So I bought this guy's course, and, uh, but to cut a long story short, I bought a first house two years later in, um, in Columbia Heights, Northwest DC. Um, and I bought it for $47,000, okay? Now, 47, this was 87. At that time, people were telling me I was getting ripped off. <laughs> I was getting duped, okay? You paid 47,000, no way. <laughs> Okay, you're crazy, you know. So that, you know, and, um, and so I bought the house anyway. I didn't know what I was doing. I, um, I met this guy at a rear club, and uh, he's the one that sold me the house. Um, you know, he said, hey, I got a house for sale. 
uh, in Columbia Heights and uh, 47K, no money down, just like the infomercial. And um, he says, there's some tenants in there. I said, okay, well, the tenants like, oh man, they're great, they're great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll stay from England, you know. All, all Americans, don't, no, Americans don't lie, you know. <laughs> so I, I took this man at his word. And uh, so I ended up buying the house. And afterwards, I found out that uh, the tenants hadn't paid him for three months. Uh, there was a water bill of $5,000. They were going to sell the house at a tax sale. And, uh, and these people were real religious, really religious. You know, it was like I was going there to collect my rent. And they were saying, well, young man, you know, according to Matthew 28, verse 15, <laughs> the Lord is good, the Lord will provide. Don't worry, young man. <laughs> so that, that, yeah, this is what's going on while I was trying to collect my rent, you know, getting scriptures. And, uh, and this was going on and on and on and on. And I went to an attorney and uh, he said, do you know anything about landlord tenant laws in DC? I said, no. He says, well, you know, sit down. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, to, to cut, the, cut to the chase, <clears throat> I was able to turn that thing around. Okay, she got some assistance uh, from the government. And uh, the way it played out was that the government ended up paying all her back rent, paid a $5,000 water bill, and got her a Section 8 voucher. Okay, she said to me, I told you the God is good. <laughs> I told you, young man. <laughs> <laughs> have faith. <laughs> it's unbelievable, okay? It's like, uh, wow. And uh, so essentially what I learned from that is what not to do. Everything that you are not supposed to do, I did. I did no due diligence. I took these people at this word. I didn't know anything. I just bought a house, okay? You probably know, you probably in this room probably know a hundred times more than what I knew when I bought my house, okay? So I plowed through it. And uh, so I lived to tell. So I kept on working. You know, I was working my regular job and just kept on buying more houses until June the 6th, 2003, when I was, at that time, I was working at IBM um, in Rockledge Drive in Bethesda uh, in their consulting group. Um, I have a business and technology background. And, uh, and so at that time, I had enough houses whereby my rental income for my properties equaled what I was making at IBM. Uh, I had a six-figure salary there at that time. This is 2003. So I was able to transition from uh, being uh, a full-time employee to a full-time real estate investor, okay? Uh, so that's essentially, and I just kept on buying since then. So uh, that is my story, and uh, I started with nothing. I knew nothing. I, I came here with $20 in my pocket to the U.S., okay? Uh, $200, I'm sorry. And, uh, but this is where I am now. So what the strategy, in a nutshell, I call it the ABC strategy, okay? What it boils down to is very simple. I buy C properties in B neighborhoods and rent to A tenants. Everybody got that? I buy C properties in B neighborhoods and rent to A tenants. What that means is that I buy, I, I, I look at the neighborhood first. You know, okay? I look for B neighborhoods, good neighborhoods, not the top of the line, not the worst, but just good neighborhoods, okay? C properties, which means that there's something wrong with the house. It needs work. Okay, so you can buy these uh, B neighborhood prop properties uh, at C prices because there's something wrong with the house. It needs renovations. Everybody got me so far? And, uh, and therefore, I rent to A tenants. Okay, A tenants are the creme de la creme. And I do Section 8s, okay? And uh, I know there's a lot of baggage associated with Section 8, but once you figure it out, which I'll talk about today, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> okay? I love being a Section 8 landlord. How about that? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not crazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not a psycho. Uh, but I, I read to A tenants. Okay? And again, this will all make sense as we go through. So, I kind of flick through. Uh, let's have a look. Okay, so just talk about cycles. Uh, e essentially, the, the way it works, which I'm sure you all know, because I've been through this several times, is that in a recession, all bets are off. And uh, the good thing about this area, the DMV, uh, is that the economy here is very strong. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not so much that. I've done a lot of travel. There's probably a lot of people here travel around the world. And there's something very similar about capitals around the world, around the world, okay? Uh, first of all, whenever you think of a country, 
usually the first place you think of is the capital of that country. If I say England, you probably say London. If I say France, you probably say Paris. If I say, you know, Iran, you probably think Tehran. You know, I mean, it's usually the capital is the first thing that comes to your mind. The reason being is that that's where the money is. That's where the seat of government is. It's a population magnet. That's where the jobs are. <clears throat> and therefore, most capital cities around the world um, tend to be a lot more resilient, uh, the economy-wise. Okay? Land is restricted, jobs are there, money is there, people want to go there. And uh, real estate, generally, if you own real estate in capitals, capital areas, usually, not always, but usually, it tends to appreciate in value. It goes through cycles, yes, but generally the projection is always positive. Okay? There's only one capital and we're in it, uh, and, uh, and so forth. So we're kind of in a very unique place. And that's the reason why I like to buy here. Okay? I can't say that for Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I can't say that for you know, whatever, wherever, <laughs> you know, I can't say for those places, but I can say that for the DC area, okay, because of those dynamics I just talked about. So if you can own real estate here, generally it's a good thing to hold onto, okay? And uh, yes, you're going to go through cycles. Yes, it's going to be some, you know, ups and downs, but generally, uh, especially during the downtime, you can usually get stuff, at a, there's less competition, if that makes sense. Uh, sellers become a lot more reasonable. I mean, you recall six months ago, a year ago, you know, you make an offer, there's about 50 other people making offers, and sellers are greedy, you know, or they, the only thing they'll consider, no contingencies, <laughs> you know, 50,000 asking price, you know, uh, da, 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 da. that's what sellers are demanding, and they were getting it, okay? Uh, fast forward today, market's a lot slower, and sellers are a lot more reasonable. Okay, uh, a house that uh, I, I bought a house, um, you know, what, a year and a half ago for 555K. Uh, this is the Eckington neighborhood. Everyone know Eckington, Northeast? Um, it's a pretty good neighborhood. And uh, there was a house that came up recently, uh, very close to there, and they were asking for five, I think it's sold, it, it's under contract now for about five, just over five. Okay? Uh, and so on, you know, so you know, these, are, these are good times to get in if you can get in, okay? So, but you need to avoid making rash decisions if possible. And uh, now is the time to learn, now is, now is the time to sort of position yourself, uh, what I call to become bankable. Because if you're bankable, you can be able to take advantage of some of these opportunities that exist today, okay? Uh, if I'm talking, uh, you know, too highfalutin, let, just bring me down to earth, but I'm trying to, you know, uh, make it, uh, as uh, realistic as possible. So I do the buy and hold strategy, okay? And uh, the reason being is that I, sh I just believe in real estate from a long-term perspective. I just believe in it, okay? Uh, especially in this area. I told you the first house I bought was 47K. Fast forward 10 years later, the same house was 150, 140, about 140 something thousand. 140,000, no way. Who's going to buy Covey Heights for 140,000? Okay? <laughs> no way. <laughs> Two years later, 350,000. No way. Who's going to live in Covey Heights for 350,000? No way. <laughs> Two years later, it's 750,000. <laughs> Whoa, who, who wants to pay $750,000 for Covey Heights? It is what it is. I mean, it's always expensive. That's the thing about this area. It's always expensive. It's always, ex it's never cheap. And you're probably thinking to yourself, there's no way I can buy it, I can afford around here. I can tell you this, 10 years from now, okay, you'll be saying, my God, if only I could buy in Columbia Heights for 750000 Oh, what was I thinking <laughs> when I didn't buy that time? You see what I'm saying? It, because it's all relative. And, uh, and so the issue then becomes, well, how do you get in? Okay, how do you get in at these crazy prices? Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so I do the buy and hold because I, I, I believe in this area. It's a bet. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, the market could tank, uh, you know, but historically, there is, I think according to the Federal Reserve uh, data, there has never been a, a seven-year stretch where prices haven't gone up in the D.C. area. Never. Okay? So it's just because of the, the, you know, the, the economy that we have here, a very unique place. Okay, so the thing becomes, you know, the bottom line really is that during a, mark, a downturn, winging it, I just call it winging it, you know, sort of, uh, 
<laughs> well, like, like what I did when I first started. I didn't know what I was doing. I just thought, you know, just did it. Uh, it doesn't always work, okay? If you don't know what you're doing, you can, you can, you can get burnt pretty bad, okay? Uh, what you do need, though, are systems, the tools, the people, the processes, and the organization to make it work. And, uh, and this is where I'm going to introduce the notion of the Section 8 here, okay? Um, in a market downturn, uh, I think when I was on Big Pox, I told you that story uh, of uh, I had a tenant, Section 8, who came to one of my houses where I lived. And she said, I'm not renting your house because it doesn't have a jacuzzi. Do you remember that story? Uh, okay. And, and anyone know what I'm talking about? Okay. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, this was in the mid-90s. Uh, I don't know if you were around in the mid-90s in the D.C. area. This is when the Marion Barry got busted. Uh, the control board took over D.C. government. I don't know if people remember that time. D.C. was like down. <laughs> it was going, I mean, it's like uh, who the hell want to live here? And, uh, and, and so on. We had a house up in uh, just off 13th Street Northwest. That's where I lived. And um, I came home one day. My next door neighbor was shot dead right in front of our house. And right in front of our house. And my wife said, we got to get the hell out of this place. <laughs> and this is Columbia Heights, okay? And, um, and so, um, but I, I like D.C., so I thought, let me just keep the house. So I kept that. We, I still own the house right now. And uh, so we fixed it up, put it out for rent. And um, I'll never forget this story. This lady came to look at the house. She had a voucher. And uh, she said, hmm, nice house, but I, I don't want to rent it. I says, why? This is a voucher holder, okay, with a net worth of zero. Uh, <laughs> okay, she says, well, the house doesn't have a jacuzzi. Uh, you know, where's your stainless steel appliances? You know, what's, what's, why should I rent this house? <laughs> I'm saying, what? <laughs> you know, I was going to scratch, scratch my head. Uh, so, I mean, I didn't understand it at the time. I understand it now what was going on. What was going on was this. And she didn't, and I'm sure she didn't take a, a PhD in macroeconomic theory, but essentially what was going on was that DC was going downhill. Okay, you had a lot of flippers who bought and uh, renovated their homes and uh, they couldn't sell it because the market had tanked. People were leaving, okay? Too much supply, not enough demand, okay? So people were leaving, and therefore those people who, um, the flippers especially, the, the, they had the jacuzzi, they had the harder floors, they had all that stuff, okay? They had the assumption that they were gonna sell it, but they couldn't sell it. So if you can't sell and they pay too much, you only got two options. You can either reduce your price or you can rent it, okay? Uh, or you can lose it, okay? And uh, so now I was competing with flippers who under normal circumstances, I wouldn't compete with. Everybody follow me? Uh, because those jacuzzi guys would have sold their homes, uh, but now they are renting it. So they're in direct competition with me, okay? And the way the Section 8 program works is that the rent that the tenant pays is based on their income, okay? So they can go to the jacuzzi house or go to my house, their portion of the rent is the same. You follow me? So they could go to uh, a shooting dead neighborhood or they go to another neighborhood. The rent is the same. You follow me? So under those circumstances, I mean, common sense was you'll, you'll go to the best place you can get. Yeah? Uh, and so on. So they say, well, screw you. There's a house down the road that's got a jacuzzi. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm going there. I mean, I didn't understand it. I mean, that, that essentially what was going on. So the, 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 the lesson learned from that is that when the market shifts, your competition changes, okay? So now you're competing with flippers, okay? The apartments are competing with condos. You follow me? And uh, because the condo guys can't sell, okay? So what are they gonna do? Are they reduce the price or are they gonna rent it, okay? And so now your apartment is competing with a condo with all the bells and whistles and things like that. Everybody follow me? Uh, and that's, the, that's, that's one of those things. So I said, okay then, uh, once I got over the shock of this lady, uh, she was what I call a tier one tenant, okay? And uh, that's a term which I created. I, call them, I used to call them Nordstrom tenants, <laughs> Nordstrom voucher holders. 
<laughs> okay, everyone has nostrils, okay, kind of credit the credit on stores. Uh, so I realized that not all voucher holders are the same. Okay, I mean, the stereotype is, you know, they're going to trash your house, you know, gangsters are going to be roaming around, and they're going to destroy your place, and, you know, you got to collect your rent with a bulletproof vest, and, you know, you get shot at. Where you, I mean, that's just... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kill or be killed, you know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's the kind of stereotype, okay? Uh, but, but I realized... They're not all the same. It's like anything. I mean, I have a business background, so you have to segment the market. Uh, and I realized that there's this group of voucher holders, which I call tier one, the Nordstroms, who are completely different. They're just like you and I. They want the same thing that you and I want. You know, they don't want to be shot at no more than you want to be shot at. They want their kids to be in a nice area, just like you do. Uh, you know, you got standards, that they got standards, and they're not going to live anywhere. You're not going to live anywhere. I mean, they're just no different. The only difference is they don't have any money. Okay, and, uh, but the goals, aspirations for, them, for themselves, for their families are no different than you and I. Okay, and uh, if, you can, uh, if you understand that, then you can create a whole business model around it, which is what I did. Okay, I said, okay, then I'm going to buy, I'm going to focus on these people, these tier one Nordstrom tenants, about section eight holders. Because so I took the time to understand them, who they are, what they want, where they want to live, where they don't want to live, who they want to rent from, who they do want to rent from. I, I took the time to understand that, okay? And I said, okay, I'm going to start buying houses, fixing them up in such a way I can appeal to these people. Because if you can appeal to these folks, four things happen. One, they take care of your property. Two, they pay the rent. <laughs> Three, they're pleasant to deal with. Four, uh, they stay a long time. And that fourth one is the absolute key, okay? Because if anyone here is a landlord, you get it. <clears throat> Turnover is the killer. It's a silent killer. Okay? It wipes out all your cash flow, all the profits that you make gets wiped out whenever you get a turnover. Okay? Uh, so if you don't believe me, a typical turnover is going to cost you at least, a t what I mean by turnover is that you've got to paint the place again, you've got to clean it up again, you've got to advertise again, there's no money coming in, and you've still got a mortgage to pay, and so on. It's a silent killer. Okay? If you can't manage to that, you make zero money, no money. I don't care what the, spread, the fancy spreadsheets say uh, and all, those, you know, all that other stuff that you read about. If you can't control turnover, you make no money. Okay? And so I had to figure a way to reduce turnover. Okay? And that's where this whole strategy comes in together. Okay? Understand who you, I mean, it's a business concept. You understand who your customer is, uh, what they're looking for, and you provide a product that meets the needs of the customer. Okay? It's business 101. And uh, essentially, that's what uh, I try to do here. So, is, is everything, is am I good so far? Okay. So, the, this, this, this voucher holder, and um, because this, okay, let me give you a story. This lady here, you see this one? This is Create Change. Okay, she's one of my tenants. Uh, this is a house up in Water Street, Northwest. Okay, I don't know if you know Water Street, it's near the Petworth Metro Station, Columbia Heights Metro Station, you know, Georgia Avenue in New Hampshire. Uh, it's around there. So, I got a house up there. She said to me, uh, I went to, uh, you know, just every so often I check in with my tenants. And uh, she said to me, Mr. Joseph, they don't call me Dr. Joe, they call me Mr. Joseph. <laughs> uh, Mr. Joseph, um, let me tell you something. She's been renting me for about uh, seven years. Okay? Uh, by living here, two of my kids have got full right to go to college. Voucher holder. Okay? They've got better schools, better neighbors, better surroundings, and uh, their outlook is completely different. Okay? Just by living there. Okay? I mean, this is some serious stuff here, and, uh, and so on. So, my longest tenant is 26 years. 26 years. I, have, uh, I spoke to one of my tenants this week. She's been with me for 18 years. I have 12, 15, 8, 10 year tenants. This stuff works. People don't stay 15, 20 years paying rents of four, five, six thousand dollars. Okay? They don't do that with market renters. If you're a market renter, 
If you're paying 4,000 bucks, 5,000 bucks for rent, how long are you going to stay there? You can say, this is crazy. Let's go buy our own house. Okay? Uh, you're not going to find that here because they can't buy the house. Okay? It's not going to happen. And therefore, they, their perspective is different. They just want a place where their family can be safe, they can be a part of the community, uh, they want a good landlord, and so forth. Okay? It's a different perspective altogether. And that's how you... Her rent at that house in Water Street is... I don't know. I think it's like $550, okay? The total rent is just under $6,000, okay? $6,000, $1,000, okay? Okay? And her portion is just over 500 bucks, okay? So let me ask you this question then. If you lived in a $800,000, $900,000 neighborhood, Okay, and you were paying five hundred dollars to live there. How long will you stay? <laughs> okay, is this making sense? Absolutely. Okay, turnover is your killer. You just told me you're going to stay there forever. <laughs> okay, so how much turnover am I going to get? None. None. Her kids have got full right to go to college. Do you think she wants to leave? Okay. Uh, do you think she's going to trash my house and get evicted? Do you think that she's eternally grateful for the opportunity that she's given? given? You, you get this now? Okay. This is the concept which I'm trying to convey here is that, you know, once you get through the, the you know, the sort of the, the baggage of Section 8, there's a business opportunity uh, once you understand it. You know, we're, we're business people, okay? We're investors. We are buying houses. Uh, we're buying the houses, um, if you're buying in this area, is to hopefully, uh, you know, take advantage of the appreciation, the tax benefits, the cash flow, the leverage. That's what we're trying to strive for. <clears throat> and you can do that with here, okay? Uh, I'm going to kind of run through. Okay, so yeah, so yeah, so uh, that's the section eight. But but as I said, but I think I talked about this. You know, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. You know, you, you, I say you get these like you know, the bigger pockets. You hear about well, go to the the, the spreadsheet. You know, the uh, Calculate. the calculators. You know, yeah. You know, what does the calculator say? You know, and uh, you do your numbers based on what the calculator says. Okay, but let me tell you something. Okay. <laughs> okay. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the calculator said. It, do, it really doesn't matter. If you can't find good tenants that take care of your property, pay the rent, and take care of your house, and stay a long time, if you can't figure that part out, it really is irrelevant what the calculator says. Okay? Because that turnover thing, uh, every turnover is going to cost you minimum two months. Um, you know, because people have to give 30 day notice, you got to paint the house, you got to clean the house, you got to, you know, da da da, da your time, you got to go show the, I mean, all that stuff adds up to at least two months. So if your rent is 4,000 bucks, every turnover is going to be at least $8,000. Okay, so if you're making 400 bucks a month and people get caught up on, well, can I increase the rent by $20 or $50? It, it doesn't matter because if you have a turnover, that's $8,000. Okay, and uh, so you, people get short. They, people get they they what's it stepping over pennies to get no no stepping over dollars to get the pennies. Is that, is that the saying? You, you talking, people focus on the wrong stuff. Okay, and people are too worried about well I need to get increase my rent. Okay, uh, thirty dollars uh, or fifty dollars or whatever it is, but they don't take they don't understand that the turnover. You know is what is going to. The $30 is irrelevant if you are going to spend $8,000 because the person leaves. So how do you get people to stay that length of time? That's why I'm saying this is, this is the whole uh, Section 8 uh, principle. Okay, okay, so let me give you an example. Um, and I, I kind of updated this one uh, to be, uh, you know, this is a recent house. Again, uh, this is Eckington. Uh, and Eckington, again, it's, not too, it's in Northeast DC. I have a lot of houses around here. And uh, this one is a three bedroom, one bath, okay? 
and uh, we turned it into a five bedroom, three and a half bath. Okay, so it's a three one, we turned it into a five, three and a half. Everybody follow me? You're gonna say, well, how in the world do you get <laughs> turn a three one into a five, three and a half? Okay, how do you do that? And um, it's uh, you, 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 at least when I what I do when I go to a house. Uh, I'm looking for things that you're not looking for, okay? I, I look, I'm, I'm coming from the perspective of the voucher holder, okay? And the way the Section 8 program works is that your rent is based on the number of bedrooms. You follow me? Uh, so in this house, okay, yeah, so this is a good story. This is a good one, yeah. This house here, I don't know if you can see. Okay, this is the house I bought, this one, this red one, okay? This house here. It's the same configuration, three bedroom, one bath. Everybody follow me? And that was for rent. And that was for rent for $3,500. Okay, everybody follow me? $3,500, the house next door. Section eight, the rent is based on the number of bedrooms. I, incre I made two extra bedrooms in the basement. Okay, there are certain requirements for bedrooms in DC, height, uh, egress, you got to have a closet. You got, I mean, there's certain requirements, okay? If you can meet all that, you can have a legal bedroom, okay? So we made two legal bedrooms in the basement to turn this three-bedroom to a five-bedroom. Everybody follow me? The house next door, the rent is $3,500. As you can see here, the house, this one, the rent is $5,476. Okay, right next door. Okay, the house next door, you have no cash flow, it's negative. Five, next door, my house, you don't make a lot of money, you're making, you know, 400 and something bucks, it's not, not a lot of money, but that's not the point. Uh, this is a long-term play. This, I'm in this neighborhood now, okay, I'm waiting for five to 10 years when people are gonna say, oh my God, if only I bought for 550,000. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's, that's the plan, everybody follow me? So, so I'm not really, I'm not trying to quit my job with this house, okay? I, I'm not going to do that. It's not going to happen, okay? I just want the thing to pay for itself, uh, get great tenants who are going to stay there for 10, 15 years, and, and I'll cash out then, okay? When this neighborhood is solid. I mean, Eckington is, the Eckington of today is not the Eckington it was 5, 10 years ago, I can tell you that. I don't know if you drive around there. It's crazy. I mean, if you go around near you know, the Rhode Island metro station area, uh, going towards, uh, you know, on the, you know, going towards North Capitol Street. That's, that's Eckington. There's a lot of stuff going on over there in terms of development. It's a hot area, uh, like most of D.C. So anyway, uh, so three bedroom turned into a five. Uh, purchase price, 550. Rehab cost, 225. Total cost, 780K. And uh, ARV, after all is said and done, was 900K. Okay? Uh, it's a 900K neighborhood. And I got it for 550 and uh, got a new loan for 720K, 80%. Um, but I have a relationship with banks where I can get more than that. The bank, one of the banks which I work with, they'll go up to 90%, okay? And then the commercial, uh, which is very, very, it's unheard of. Uh, but I have the relationships to do that, okay? So, um, so that's just for simple, say, uh, you, know, you know, simple numbers, uh, 720K, which is 80% of the 900. Okay, and uh, PI, uh, I, I, put, I put the calculation at 5.5%. Uh, I've got mine, when I got this, it was a lot lower than that. I, I kind of updated the numbers to be you know, a bit more reflective of what's going on today. Interest rates obviously are higher today, um, but I just upped it to 5.5%. I, I think when I got it, it was 4 point, 4 point something. Um, but I just put it at 5.5 just for you know, uh, demonstration purposes. Uh, so the PI, principal interest, is uh, 4421. Four, four, That's the principal interest, okay? Uh, add on your tax and insurance, 625. PITI is 5046. Everybody follow me? And the rent is 5462. That's how much Section 8 pays for this area. Okay, higher than market. That's how much they pay, okay? Uh, so now there's uh, 416 gross cash flow. The house is new in terms of the internals, new electrical, new plumbing, new heating system. So you're sort of what we call capital expenses. CapEx is pretty low because everything is new. 
and uh, and that's what I like to do is to you know just to go in, update it, and be done with it. And uh, the tenant there is uh, I'm not going to tell you how much she pays because you'll be you'll be horrified. She pays one hundred and forty five dollars. <laughs> Okay. Now, nine hundred thousand dollar neighborhood, five bedroom house, stainless steel appliances, hardwood floors, uh, master suite. One hundred forty five dollars. How long are you gonna be there for? <laughs> no jacuzzi. No jacuzzi. No jacuzzi. <laughs> Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't I did, I did, I did for the jacuzzi. No. <laughs> I'm sorry? Uh, the rehab uh, it took about f uh, four months. Three and a half to four months uh, to, to do this. And uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, the, the tenants that you have, mm -hmm. in your experience, is this their first time experiencing... Um, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, living versus uh, are there people that this is their second go around in this kind of experience or are okay. most of them, uh, this is the first time that they're getting a landlord like you and an sure. and, and opportunity like this? Sure. Okay. This is, uh, this is the, the crux of, it's a good question. This is the crux of this business model. Okay. Most Section 8 landlords have got crappy houses in crappy neighborhoods and they're crappy landlords. Okay? So these tier one tenants, they're used to crappy houses in crappy neighborhoods with crappy landlords. Okay? Because most landlords with good houses in good neighborhoods, when they hear the word Section 8, it's like, uh, 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 I gotta do what I gotta do not to rent to this Section 8 because they're gonna trash my house, they're gonna, uh, so on, okay? And, and so, as I said before, there's some good people there. They're just looking for an opportunity, but their choices are limited to crappy houses and crappy neighborhoods with crappy landlords. So if, you, so if everyone's playing here, and I'm playing here, okay? And I stage my homes, as you can see here, if you look at the bottom. And nobody stages their homes. Uh, so they come into my home. It's like, what? I mean, I, I, I would have no problem living there myself, okay? No problem living there myself, okay? And they come to these homes, and uh, they're saying, you take Section 8? And, uh, okay, let me give you another story. Here, here's a good one. Um, I had a house. This was in uh, Rosedale uh, Street in North, you know, north Northeast. Um, uh, it's a five bedroom as well, rented a voucher holder. What I normally do before I rent to somebody, I go to their homes as part of the screening process, very detailed screening process. Uh, so I make a home visit. The reason being that uh, how someone keeps their house today is how my house is going to be in three months. Okay, I don't care what anybody says. And uh, you can't tell if someone's going to be a good tenant just because they got a nice car or they got a good job or they wear nice clothes. You can't tell at all. Okay, the only way to know, well, the best way to know is to go to their home now. Okay, so I went to this lady's home. She lives in Congress Heights in Southeast. And, uh, and you know, I went there, it's a pretty rough part of town, pretty rough. And uh, so I went there and, you know, went to her home. And she says, Mr. Joseph, don't judge me by what's outside because I can't control that. Okay, judge me by what's inside my house. And her house was immaculate, spotless. The kids are well behaved. And she says to me, Mr. Joseph, every day, the biggest concern I have every single day, okay, is my kids won't come home from school because they're going to get shot and killed. Every single day, that's what's on her mind. Now, you guys are worried about if I go to Starbucks, my ice is too cold or it's too hot. <laughs> You know, or, you know, or it's too, you know, it's too much sugar in the coffee. You know? 
She's worried about her kids getting killed. <laughs> okay. Uh, she said, if you give me a chance, you give me a chance to rent your house, I promise you, I promise you, absolutely promise you, you'll never regret it. Okay. This is what we're dealing with. Okay. Uh, these are tier one tenants who are not given chances. And when you provide that opportunity, I mean, I get 10, 15 applications, uh, you know, uh, on these, these, this house. You know, you can raise the bar in terms of your screening. You want to come to my house? Sure. No problem. Let's go. Because my house is just like this. They're not intimidated by that. Okay, this is, you know, it, it, it's, it, you probably don't believe me, but, you know, hopefully you do, because this is, this is what it is. Uh, and uh, so you can raise the bar, and uh, you don't have to set the bar low, because, and I've been through downturns where you have a house, and nobody comes to see it, or no applications. You know, I mean, that's, a, that's another side of this stuff, you know, where you got to give away you know, free toasters, to get an application. <laughs> Been there, done that. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's rough, you know, when you got a house and nobody wants to rent it and you got a mortgage coming due, okay? And that's when you say, well, you know, somebody shows up, you know, uh, how much is the rent? 3,000 bucks. Okay, 3,000, 100, 200. Can I move it down? <laughs> you know, uh, you know uh, that, that 3,000 was real. <laughs> Real tempted, you know, where you got a mortgage due there tomorrow and uh, you got no applications. Uh, so you're going to have to lower your screening standards just to get somebody in there. And that's, that's the start of all the problems, especially in D.C. where it's hard to get rid of people and, and so on. So, so essentially, that's what's this. So this is a, a typical scenario. Um, yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, yeah, so I put a new loan for 720, okay, to pay off most of the original, uh, you know, what I, so I buy a house. I go to a bank for the acquisition and also for the renovation. Everybody got me? And, uh, and then, uh, so I factor in how much I can get from the bank uh, on the, this is a classic burr, uh, you know, on the acquisition, the renovation. And then whatever, what I do is uh, there's three forms of financing I use. There's the bank financing. Uh, I have some private investors, people that know me and trust me, and they borrow me money. You know, I mean, people are tired of 0.1% of the bank. You know, they want a decent return on their money, but they're not just going to give you the money. I mean, this is money that they worked hard for. Okay, they're not just going to give it to you because you want it. You know, that's where your integrity comes in. That's whether do they, are you a person of, of, of you know, are you going to be a good steward of their money? Their I mean, there's a lot of things that goes into people borrowing you money. But once, but you all, we all can do it. And, uh, but if you can tap into the private money, then, uh, you know, which is what I, I've, I've done, then that pays another portion of the money, and then I top it the difference of my personal money. So it's really like three levels of financing for each of these deals. There's bank money. I go with banks uh, because bank money is cheaper, you know, and, uh, and banks have a lot of money, you know, and uh, as long as you meet their criteria. And once you understand their criteria, then you can, you know, go with that. If you can't, then you go with hard money. Uh, you got to do what you got to do to get the money. Uh, but uh, I try to go to the cheapest source of money. And the cheapest source of money are banks. And, but there's nothing wrong with hard money and so forth. You have to go where you, you know, if you can't qualify for bank financing, but can only just get for hard money, then so be it. Could be, but you got to start. And, uh, and so on. I'm sorry, there's a question? Oh, yes. When you put the two bedrooms in the basement, yeah, this is. I didn't dig on this one. Oh. Uh, I've dug in houses before, but this one I didn't dig. Uh, the ceiling was 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 high enough. Uh, all the houses I do, everything's permitted. Uh, so you got to go to. Typically, there's uh, at least four or five permits. They've got electrical, building, plumbing, mechanical. Uh, you have a demo as well. Okay, so everything has to go through that whole process, inspections and so forth. It's, it's, everything's above board. You know, we don't, I mean, I try the other way, you know, kind of keep the, you know, close the windows. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> keep down the noise. <laughs> I tried that one. 
it's not sustainable, you know. <laughs> You know, every, every now and then you get a neighbor who doesn't like you. Uh, so the first thing I do when I go to an area, a house, I, I go to the neighbors and bring them gifts. You know? <laughs> that usually kind of, uh, you know, but I still get purpose anyway. So, uh, but it's good to, um, you know, be in good terms with your neighbors and so on. Yeah, everything is permitted, yes. Okay, so you just, so you, you put the two bedrooms in the basement? Mm -hmm. Two bedrooms, a bathroom in the basement. And uh, upstairs, we have a living room, dining room, kitchen, and a parlor room. Upstairs, we have, sorry, on the first floor. Second floor, we have three bedrooms, two bathrooms. There's a master bedroom uh, with its own private bathroom, and there's two other bedrooms, another bathroom upstairs. And there are two bedrooms and the bathroom in the basement. Okay? And uh, that's what we do. Okay? And uh, it's, 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 if you've got good contractors, and you have good, because contractors are, are, you know, I mean, we can all, I'm sure, have contractor stories. Uh, oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> hey, I've had guys who show up drunk, okay? Uh, there's this guy who showed up, you know, we're supposed to be at 9 o'clock, okay? Uh, 9 o'clock comes, he's not there. 9.30, he's not there. You know, 10 o'clock, he's not there. So, you know, so I go to his house. And he was sleeping, you know. <laughs> He says, I said, what's going on? We're supposed to be at 9 o'clock. It's 11 o'clock now. He says, oh, the cat knocked over the alarm clock. So, uh, that's the reason why I'm late. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all kinds of stories. Yeah, guys who don't have a car, so you got to pick them up. You know, you got to you know, trade the target out of Home Depot, you know. Because they don't have a car, you got to come back at nighttime to take them home. <laughs> oh, I've been there and done that. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Uh, but when you get good tenants, oh, it's a blessing. It makes it so much easier. I've used the same guys for the last eight years <clears throat> and uh, same people. It's, it's great. You know, you don't have to worry about it. Things are moving and, uh, and so on. So these are all the, you know, again, these are experiences. It didn't happen overnight. It took time, uh, but it works, you know, and, uh, and so on. So uh, that's just kind of, I don't know. Uh, how, how much time have we got? Eight o'clock? About Ten more minutes and then you go to the Q and A. Okay, ten minutes. Okay, I'll try and wrap it up in ten minutes. Then. Fifteen, yeah. No okay. Problem. Okay. <laughs> okay. Was well, this okay? So everything's okay so far. Everyone's following me where I'm going, and uh, and so on. So you know, so kind of moving into the now what? Okay. And I think it's the next steps. You know, um, it's scary. To, to, to do this. It's scary to buy a house. It's very intimidating, uh, you know, especially if you're just starting out because you don't know anybody, you haven't got the right tools in place, you know, you're scared of getting ripped off. I got ripped off in my first house by that, you know, that investor, you know, who I believed didn't lie. <laughs> I, mean, I got duped big time, okay? I was straight off the boat, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, hey, <laughs> uh, it's scary, but, you know, uh, but, but still, okay, you have to take action. Otherwise, you won't do anything, you know, and then you'll be looking back two years from now, five years from now, you know, uh, it's too expensive now, I can't do it. Okay, then you wait another five years, it's too expensive now, I can't do it. You, you see what I'm saying? At some point, you have to say, this is what I'm going to do. I want to make this thing work. I believe in real estate, um, you know, and I believe that real estate is a vehicle that can build wealth. Uh, it's a vehicle that uh, can allow me to get financial independence. It's a vehicle whereby, um, you know, for the first house I bought, the one, the forty-seven thousand dollar. <throat> At that time, after all is said and done, my cash flow was fifty dollars. $50, okay? After enduring, God is good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, young man. Okay. For $50. <laughs> okay. And that was going on for months. For $50. <laughs> okay? Anybody will probably say, why, why are you doing that? Why did you buy that? Are you crazy? For $50? Okay? The house on that block are now going for 800000 okay? The, the mortgage is paid off. 
the rent there is 4,700. Okay. I've got a home equity line on that house, which I bought more houses from. Okay. If I didn't buy that house with fifty with fifty dollars cash flow, <laughs> none of that would have happened. None of it. You would have probably walked by and said, "No way am I buying this house." Okay. And I'll tell you another story. Anyone know where uh, Corcoran Street is in North? It's in like uh, Logan Circle area. Yeah. In the mid nineties, I could have bought a house on that fourteen hundred block. The seller was selling it for one hundred twenty six thousand dollars. I offered them 120. So we were haggling over six thousand dollars. <laughs> and I said, no deal. Can you believe that? <laughs> six thousand dollars. Okay, how's all that block again? Like one and a half million, two million dollars now. <laughs> okay. It is what it is. It's always expensive. Okay, you know, time, let time work for you because that's what happens in this area. Time is, time is a savior. You bought something, you think you paid too much, hold on to it. A few years later, you're glad you bought it at that price. Okay, most people have three regrets. They wish they started earlier, they wish they bought more, and they wish they kept more. Okay, that's what most people, you know, in, when they reflect, is that I wish I started earlier, I wish I bought more, and I wish I kept more. I mean, the stuff, I mean, I, I, I flipped a house in, in you know, Kentucky Avenue in, South, in the Capitol Hill. A couple of houses there. I flipped them, okay? And <clears throat> I bought it for 200 and something thousand and sold it for like, I don't know, 300 and something. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking back now, I said, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> you know, uh... It, you know, I mean, flipping is good. There's nothing wrong with flipping. But after you cut through the chase, after you pay your taxes and go through all the, the rituals you have to go through, you make a few bucks, but you're going to spend the money. And then you have nothing to show for it. You know, five, ten years from now, okay? You don't. Uh, whereas if you hold on to this stuff, you have something tangible, something physical, uh, something that uh, can build wealth, Okay? And if you can find quality tenants who are going to take care of your house, pay the rent, pleasant to deal with, and stay a long time, if you can do that. And I'm, my, 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 my suggestion is that Section 8 allows you to do that. Once you get rid of all the baggage associated with that program, there's a lot of good people there and, uh, and so on. So I, I primarily focus on four, five, and six bedroom houses. Uh, so I take... And there are only four, five, and six bedroom houses generally in D.C. Most houses in D.C. are three bedrooms. But there are people with four, five, and six bedroom vouchers. Okay? So those people, the demand is there. The supply is just not there. Okay? Because most houses in D.C. don't exist as four, five, and six. Somebody has to create them. Okay? And that's what we do here. We create these, these, these properties that don't exist. Okay, we turn an asset that is um, negative cash flow potentially or break even into positive cash flow. Okay, uh, and my saying is that you can't do that with market renters. Not having five, 10, 15 year tenants. It, it, you just don't do it. It's not gonna happen. Because no, none of you, I think, would pay four or $5,000 for 15 years rent. None of you. I, well, well, is there anybody who would? Uh, no. It, it's not going to happen. Okay? And, uh, but for a voucher holder, it, it, when I tell them my longest tenant, when I show in a house and I say I have 15, 20 year, 26 year tenants, this is music to their ears. Okay? Oh, at last. Stability. At last. My kids can be in a, in a good area. At last. You know, I mean, this is something, I mean, you, go, you, you, you probably, you know, you probably think, uh, you know, you kind of have to understand it from their perspective. It's different. It's a different perspective. Um, you know, it's music to their ears. And so 
in my, you know, as I close it out, the competition is pretty low because most landlords that focus on Section 8 are crappy landlords with crappy housing, crappy neighbor, neighbor areas, okay? Uh, the competition is very weak, in my opinion. And, uh, and if you kind of do what I've shared with you today, uh, you, 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 you can do, it's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. I mean, I didn't figure this out today, you know. Uh, every Mother's Day, I give all my tenants Mother's Day gifts. Every Christmas, I send them Christmas presents. Um, you know, if the kids get A's at school, we give them $50. Uh, and uh, I get all, we, got, we got a timeshare in Massanutten, you know, a couple of hours from here. All my tenants get free vacations. Okay? <laughs> Did your landlord do that? <laughs> okay? It's very simple. My goal is to be the best landlord they've ever had. Okay, all the stuff I've just described cost me 200 bucks, okay, after you cut through the chase. But the goodwill which it, it generates, you don't stand a chance taking my tenants from me. They're not leaving me, okay? Um, because they don't know who you are. And they don't know if you're one of those crappy landlords or the crappy houses or the crappy neighbors. So the devil you know is sometimes better than the devil you don't know. Uh, and, and so on. So, that's, so it's essentially what it is, it's a firewall. Because we all want the same people. We all want the good tenants who pay their rent, take care of the property. We all want that. Everybody here wants that. And uh, so when I get one of those things, I want to prevent you poaching them. And that's what I do, I, you know, is to create that firewall and, and so on. Make sense? Uh, okay, let me wrap it up because I know that uh, Russell's getting antsy now. <laughs> uh, okay, put it all together. Work on yourself. Uh, yeah, so... In terms of action items, as we move on from here, there's several things I, I would suggest. Work on yourself, uh, set goals, uh, you know, understand your strengths and weaknesses. We all have strengths and weaknesses. Uh, if you've got a spouse, talk it over with them. Make sure they've got buy-in, because if they don't have buy-in, it's, it's difficult, uh, you know, working uphill. Um, you know, take time for education and learning. Uh, decide on which method of focus you want to go on. There's lots of different segments in real estate. You've got uh, buy and hold, you've got wholesaling, you've got fix and flip, you've got, you know, whatever. There's lots of different, you know, niches. You can't do them all. <clears throat> pick one and focus on that. Okay, I pick the buy and hold. Okay, and that's my thing. I'm not into da 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 I don't get you know, into those sort of shiny object syndrome where, I, you know, today I'm doing this, tomorrow I'm doing that. You know, you end up not doing anything. Uh, so pick one. Learn the basics. You don't need to know it all, otherwise you'll have that paralysis analysis, or whatever they say. You won't do anything because you're always saying, well, I just need to learn a bit more. You know, there's no, you, you can never learn enough, okay? You, have, you learn the basics, and, but this is the key one, number four, is you identify and work with a mentor, well, or, or not so much a mentor, but find somebody who's successfully doing what it is that you want to do. You know what I mean? Whatever it is that you want to do, find somebody who's successfully doing it because if you can do that, they will show you that, that you'll learn from their experiences. You learn from their mistakes. So you don't have to make them. You know? uh, it's a faster way to get to where you want to go to rather than trying to figure it out yourself because you can't. And uh, if I want to be a doctor, the best way is to associate myself with successful doctors because I can learn from their experiences and rather than trying to make those unnecessary mistakes, I call them. And then proceed. Take action until your next your first deal. I mean, at some point, you have to take action. And uh, in closing, there's nothing wrong with trying. At least you tried. Uh, learn from your experiences and move forward. Take charge. Seize the opportunities during short windows. And it's up to you at the end of the day to make it happen. And if you want to engage with me, uh, you know, you can, you know, I've got a website here, joasimo.com. Uh, I have a legacy network and, uh, you know, send you stuff. Uh, you can, I have a Wealth Wednesday every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on YouTube. Uh, it's free. I did one yesterday. We talked about pros and cons of partnerships yesterday. Pretty good one. Uh, it's free. So, you know, uh, I talk about it. Usually educational. Russ has been there. Uh, and, um, and I talk about different subjects that pertain to real estate investing. You can email me at joe at joeassimo.com. Uh, I'm on Instagram. I'm not as active as I used to be, but I'm on Instagram. And uh, if you're serious, though, if you're serious and would like to one-on-one, -on -one, uh, with me, you can apply. I'm, I'm creating this thing called a JV Wealth Builders Program. Uh, I, 
this is something new for me, and it's going to be invitation only. That's it. Okay. Now, essentially, what it is, um, yeah. Okay. So, essentially, what it is is that um, I, I used to have a, another JV program where I teach, I give people the chance to look over my shoulders as I did the deal, and that was quite successful. Uh, we'll have 15 to 20 people join, but the reality is that out of 15 or 20, only three, four, or five actually pull the trigger and do a deal. Okay, uh, I mean that's just the, the the way it is. A lot of people want to do it but don't do it. They just gather information and don't do anything. Okay, and what I enjoyed was working with people to execute, when you know to do the deal. Where I work with them once they got the deal and to take it all the way through fruition. And I really enjoy that. And so that's what this program is all about, is that uh, you know, essentially what it is, is that uh, I'm going to provide, you, you can leverage my experiences, my network, my systems, my uh, experiences uh, for 25 years, where I'll help you find the deal. We've got relationships with real estate agents and brokers. Uh, we'll help you renovate the project, my relationship with my contractors, um, you know, relationship with uh, getting tenants my relationship with the DC Housing Authority and navigating all that whole process, and also my relationship with financial institutions to get the money to get the refinance. I told you about getting 90% return, 90%, uh, uh, you know, what's it called, on the refi, so you can pull up most of your money out. Uh, that's with one of the local banks that I work with. So, I mean, I have all those relationships, those experiences, and, and, and so the idea is that this wealth building program is whereby I work with you. We'll, we'll, we'll get you a deal. Uh, we'll help you get the financing. We'll help you get the, do the rehab. Uh, we'll help you get the tenant. Uh, I mean, all of that. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's not like the other way. This is, this is, the goal here is to execute, is to do the, do the deal, pull the trigger, okay? Not just talk about it, but pull the trigger, because at the end of the day, that's what we need to do. I don't think there's anything like this over here. Uh, I'm only interested in doing, I'm not interested in doing, I, I mean, I, there's only going to be a handful of people, that's it, maybe four or five. It's not one of those mass marketing things. I'm just not, I, I don't, I'm not interested in that. I, I enjoy my life. I enjoy traveling. I'm going to Ghana in a couple of weeks. Uh, I'll go to three countries this year. And, but I do enjoy helping people execute. I really enjoy the fact that um, I can say to somebody, I'll say to my mother, my mother. Oh, yeah, anyway, he's getting restless. <laughs> Okay, if you're interested, uh, what's it called? Uh, you know, the idea is that you do deals like what I showed you in, uh, what's it called, um, the Eckington deal. Well, that's the kind of stuff we do, where you get you know, $150,000 equity on day one. You got cash flow on day one, okay? And you got an asset where you got a tenant who's going to be uh, with you, hopefully 5, 10, 15, 20 years. This is what, this is what the program's all about. Uh, it takes it into, from the theory to the real world, and I'm really excited by it. Uh, I haven't, we haven't yet got it uh, finalized. But uh, what's it called? Uh, hopefully, we'll be rolling it out very shortly. If you're interested, uh, text me your name, your first name, your last name, uh, your email address, and also your phone number. Okay? And uh, once everything is finalized, we'll be able to, uh, what's it called? Uh, um, I'll meet with you, and we'll see if it's a good match. If it is, let's go ahead. If it's not, it's okay. There's only going to be four or five people anyway, so, <laughs> so uh, you have to qualify to get in, okay? It's not going to be for everybody um, because you have to have the right mindset and uh, you've got to be serious. Uh, this is not for joking around, okay? And, uh, oh, wow, my... my. <laughs> okay, that's it. So that's it, done. <laughs>